Thanks very much. I want to start by acknowledging that we're meeting here on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I want to pay my, my respects to their elders, past, present and future. And extend that respect to other Indigenous people across the country. People who never ceded their sovereignty over this land, where they had built over tens of thousands of years a sophisticated, complex agricultural and trading society. People who have been the subject of the most successful genocide in human history. Because not only did the invaders massacre and poison them, burn their crops, destroy their houses, knock down their fish traps, tear down their kangaroo nets, but they deliberately and extraordinarily effectively wiped out the cultural memory of the existence of those things. Told them and us that they were savages, hunter-gatherers, with no society worthy of the name. Terra nullius. And when they come to us with the spirit of generosity and cooperation, which in that context is hard to fathom, and ask for a voice in our democracy, our government responds, yeah, nah. I start with that extended acknowledgement, not only because it's right and needs to be said, but because we're here this evening to talk about the crisis in our democracy and how we can build a democracy for the common good, an ecological democracy, as I like to call it. And this is a gaping and festering wound at the heart of our democracy. And we will never succeed in building a democracy for the common good until we heal it. What's more, the more we learn about Aboriginal society, about their relationship with the land and with each other, their commons-based society, the more we find it has hugely important lessons for us today. Today, democracy is in crisis. In Australia and around the world, our system has skewed so badly that it's often difficult to describe what we have today as truly democratic. Naomi Klein, Christine Milne, even AC Grayling and other centrists describe our present reality as a plutocracy or even a kleptocracy. Corporations and the super rich buy access and decisions, pervert the political debate, enclose public space for their private profit and freely pollute. Meanwhile, people are told that we're consumers, not citizens. Our relationship with government has become one of client and service provider at best, and our influence over decisions which shape our lives and the future of our planet is constrained more and more. If the role of citizens is constrained, there's no role for nature at all. So what are the main political responses arising from the, neo, the collapse of the neoliberal consensus? Primarily, we see a turn to the extreme right, a reinvigoration of social democracy, and in the middle, a clinging to liberalism. In my view, the first is utterly unacceptable, the second is insufficient, and the third is naive. While the Greens have done well in a few places, it can't be said that Green politics is seen broadly as even in the picture as a response to the democratic crisis. How can it be when the concept of a Green politics is poorly understood, even by many in the party, when the internal fight seems to be between those who see it as a form of socialism and those who see it as a form of liberalism? We need to get past the watermelons versus neoliberals on bikes caricature of a political debate and build a shared and well-understood conceptualization of ecological democracy as something distinct, a radical political vision of deep interconnection and interdependence, rejecting capitalism's hyper-individualism, growth fetish, and celebration of greed, beyond socialism, while unashamedly of the left, intrinsically intersectional, embedded in nature. I want to try to set out tonight an articulation of ecological democracy that draws on post-Marxist thought, Gramsci, Bookchin and Gibson Graham in particular, as well as contemporary psychological and sociological research from Common Cause and others, and very deeply from the ancient wisdom being recently re-articulated in the politics of the commons. 
Before we prescribe a solution, however, it's important to diagnose where we are and how we got here. We are, I would suggest, at the end point of a millennia-long process of alienation and disconnection and of homogenization. Since we first started building cities and leaving the land, we've been disconnecting from nature, losing sight of it quite literally, losing our vocabulary of it, to the extent that blackberry is no longer a fruit to be plucked and eaten, but a device to tie us to our labour even when we're on the toilet. <laughs> we're alienated from each other in our metal and concrete boxes. We're alienated from our labour as David Graeber discusses in his theory of bullshit jobs. We're alienated by a system which proclaims, yes, we are all individuals, which declares we have great choice while turning everything into the same grey goo, Disney World, supermarket aisle full of different but identical toothpastes, which insists that we have great freedoms while systematically removing more and more of our capacity to influence the direction of our society. While this slow severing has been going on for thousands of years, it's the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution and capitalism which performed the amputation. Where previous, of course, deeply problematic systems still included some form of internal balance, often a religious imperative to share, or a feudal system of devolved mutual responsibility, capitalism for the first time threw that out. As Karl Polanyi wrote in The Great Transformation, while all previous social organising principles saw markets, land and money, money embedded within social relations, capitalism disembeds them, removing any social, religious or moral constraints from the operation of the market. Capitalism thus becomes the first social organising principle based on selfishness, the first system to make greed, competition, non-cooperation its credo. It's no coincidence that this era of disconnection is the era which has seen the progressive and systematic enclosure and destruction of the commons. A destruction so complete that most of us no longer understand what the commons is. We think of it in our disconnected way as a standalone thing a field, or the atmosphere, some mystifying form of property which belongs to everyone and thus to no one. But the commons is much more than that. An ancient concept imbued with deep understandings of connection to each other and to the natural world we're part of, the commons is better understood as a system than a form of property. It's a system by which a community agrees to manage resources equitably and sustainably. As commons theorist David Bollier describes it, it's a resource plus a community plus a set of social protocols. The commons isn't the field where the people graze their cattle. It's the field and the people and the way in which the people agree to share the field, to keep it healthy, to prevent freeloaders and share the benefits. It's telling that in Garrett Harding's complete mischaracterization in the tragedy of the commons, he sets out how individuals who, for some reason, can't or won't talk to each other, can't and won't cooperate with each other, will fail to manage commonly held resources. Well, that's no surprise, but it's not a description of a commons. It's a description of capitalism and the alienation and disconnection at its core. This disconnection is also the core of our democratic crisis. How can we have an effective democracy when our socio-political culture tells us to think only of our own self-interest and that that's what everyone around us is doing? Common Cause's fascinating Perception Matters research quantifies this, showing that while 75% of people feel personally guided by altruistic values such as care, protecting and feeling part of nature, universalism and self-direction, a similar proportion feel that other people around them are driven by selfish values of wealth and power. This breeds lack of trust, disengagement and disenfranchisement and undermines our democracy.
How much worse does it become when governments are deliberately constraining our role as citizens, criminalising and delegitimising protest and advocacy by citizens while welcoming the participation of corporations? It sends a clear message. Democracy is not for you. Now, we know who's responded most effectively to this so far with slogans like, Make America Great Again, Take Back Control, Reclaim Australia. The extreme right demagogues correctly diagnose the disenfranchisement, but then they perform the classic fascist bait and switch. They grab the disconnection and bring people together, not in order to cooperate to build better futures, but rather as the mob. They rile people up about unfairness, inequality and lack of control, all of which are true, and then misdirect it away from the real causes of corporate capitalism and towards some scary other, Jews, Muslims, blacks, immigrants, gays, greenies, the unemployed. Meanwhile, as Naomi Klein writes in her latest book, they use the cover to complete the corporate takeover of the state. While the other prim what are the other primary responses to the collapse of the liberal democratic consensus? Reinvigoration of social democracy and the clinging to liberalism. The latter, epitomised by A.C. Grayling in Democracy in Crisis, insists that we must rescue liberal representative democracy through improving civics education, supporting public interest journalism, and similar necessary but far from sufficient steps. It believes that the system that got us into this mess can, with a few tweaks, get us out of it. Naive. If the crisis that we face is one of disconnection, we will not solve it with responses which still cast the citizen in a bit part rather than as the protagonist. The former, and this is where I may get controversial in this room, led by Corbyn and Sanders for the many but not the few, is insufficient. A key part of the problem for me is that socialism, like capitalism to which it is a response, is a political tool for managing the economy, the production and consumption and exchange of goods and services. And both frame society entirely within that rubric. Neither has the capacity to deal with the current disconnection that, it's at, that is at the heart of the crises we face. Both tend to drive homogenization steamrolling local cultures, failing to appreciate the strength that comes from interconnected diversity, the secret recipe of ecology. While socialism is part of the answer, it's not the full answer. There's more. We don't face a binary choice between the invisible hand of the market and the dead hand of centralised control. We do not face a choice between privatisation and public ownership. Ecological democracy presents another model that is about participatory, deliberative democratic paths embedded in nature based on the principle of subsidiarity or putting control into the most local hands possible and limiting the opportunities for domination and free riding. Viewed another way, under capitalism, nothing is connected, everything is atomized, all is abstraction. Under socialism, people are connected, although there is a systemic tendency towards centralization which can undermine democratic and participatory processes. And importantly, it lacks the insight that people are part of nature. Conceptualize it a third way. For the right, government should get out of the way of business but maintain social order. It's a rhetoric of freedom with an increasingly obvious undercurrent of hard control. For the old left, government knows best. It's a rhetoric of democracy with an undercurrent of paternalism which is increasingly apparent, for example, in the race and gender relations amongst Bernie bros in the US. Neither of them gives people back control over their own destiny. Neither of them can deal with the disconnection and disenfranchisement which are at the heart of the crises we face. For ecological democracy, government's role is to enable people and communities to find their own way within the context of equity and sustainability, within clear, democratically developed limits to prevent abuse. This is, of course, a left politics. It implies strong regulation of corporations and markets because they're based currently on rewarding free riding, which damages people and the planet. 
It implies high taxes on the rich and substantial redistribution of wealth because they are the basis of cooperation and trust. It implies true equity, deep systemic equity. If that's the conceptualization of an ecological democracy, what might it mean in practice? Excuse me. Okay, I'll try to rush through it. Essentially, the task is to connect people again, to re-enfranchise ourselves. This has to be done from the bottom up, but it can be supported institutionally rather than undermined. And it can be done through prefigurative politics, showing what it can be and building towards it. In order to make the community, the commons, the focal point of government, we need to build participatory democratic processes and institutions at every level. There are some examples of this already being undertaken. The citizens' jury model empowers a selection of citizens to make recommendations to government about major issues such as nuclear waste, regulation of cycling, for example, in South Australia. The secret to their success is government's commitment to respecting the outcome. The diametric opposite was Turnbull's equal marriage poll, disingenuously proposed with a clear desire to disenfranchise younger people and with an open contempt for the result in advance. What was remarkable and inspiring was that citizens seized it, enrolling to vote and then voting in huge numbers, making it politically impossible for MPs to ignore. Deeper participatory processes include proactive local planning, participatory budgeting, institutionalised citizens' assemblies and more. But it's also vital to broaden our conception of the bounds of the political. Many practices of commoning, which are growing rapidly around the world, citizen-run spaces from community gardens to sharing groups, repair cafes to local barter economies, are fundamentally democratic practices. Similarly, the growth of cooperatives is about citizens grabbing back some level of control. Governments can and should support these modes of participation. We can give institutional support to sharing and repairing, for example, from underwriting public liability insurance to giving tax breaks to repair, like the Swedish Greens have recently implemented. We can regulate to encourage and support the development of community and worker-owned cooperatives, from childcare to fruit packing, food, health and housing co-ops, all the way through to large-scale energy cooperatives. Taking co-ops into the political sphere, I'm inspired by the recently elected government of Barcelona. In the wake of the GFC, with Spain in dire straits and government and EU institutions driving austerity, a tremendous co-op-based people's movement arose across the country. The Indignados, the movement of the squares, food sharing co-ops, childcare, healthcare, housing co-ops, squatters groups and more. In Barcelona, they powerfully organised into a political movement called Barcelona en Comú, Barcelona in Common. I was lucky enough to travel there last year and met with some of the people involved, hearing about the direct line between building those co-ops, organising them together in grassroots ways with both practical projects and theoretical thinking, leading to the creation of a political project which won minority government. Now, of course, they're struggling with how to create institutional change against the backdrop of national and global powers arraigned against them. But they're trying, and it will be fascinating to see how they go. I also travelled to London and met with the people behind the Participatory City project there. They're working with local government to provide institutional support to communities to develop their own projects, from cooking co-ops to knitting groups, pop-up shops to creative cafes, partly because of what each project brings in itself, but largely because of the overarching benefits to the community. They've already found that these project, projects reduce a vast range of social ills, from homelessness to drug addiction to family violence. They see it as a different mode of politics, not public, not private, not paternalistic, participatory. Very briefly, conscious of time, I want to raise three final points that I see as important strategic points of intervention. Firstly, there's one of my personal passions, reclaiming public space from advertising. This is one of the starkest examples of government handing over the commons to private interests to profit from. We can and must reclaim it, as cities such as San Paolo and Grenoble have done already. Secondly, there's the question of rebalancing rights between corporations, people and nature. 
a central insight of ecological democracy is that there is no viable politics of the left which does not place protection of nature at its heart. If you understand that humanity is part of nature, you cannot work to improve humanity's lot without cherishing and protecting nature. Equally, there's no viable green politics which doesn't challenge the cultural and legal primacy of the profit motive. These are fundamentally intertwined. So an important point of intervention is to rebalance our politics, which has skewed drastically to put corporations at the centre, outweighing the rights of people, delegitimising civil society and ignoring nature altogether. As well as fighting for human and civil rights, we need to remove the massive power of corporations, take away their legal personhood unless they behave more fully as humans rather than as purely profit-driven psychopaths, and at the same time, grant legal rights to nature. Why should BHP Billiton be a legal person, but the Great Barrier Reef should not be? And finally, there's a universal basic income. Just like we agree that nobody should do without health care and nobody should go without at least a basic education, nobody should be left in poverty in a wealthy society. But deeper than that, UBI is an inherently democratising project. It reconceives the relationship between the citizen and the state. It recognises that there is a multitude of different ways people participate and contribute, not just through paid labour. It rebalances power between employers and employees. It gives people the basic resources they need to take the steps they may want to take in life. It's an enabling policy for the great majority, while through the implied and necessary tax increases on the rich, it's a limiting and devaluing freeloading and greed. The history of this cult country since 1788 is a history of enclosure of the commons. And it's a history which has led us, alongside the rest of the world, into crisis. Ecological crisis, social crisis, democratic crisis. Only a commons-based, participatory, ecological democracy can pull us out of the double helix spiral towards fascism and ecological collapse. We've got to get out there and build it. Yeah.